Light and Darkness by Irving Risch Preface Before I start, I need to clear up a few things. Seeing we will be looking at light and darkness in a physical and spiritual sense, let us first get a grip on what these words mean. Light, something that makes vision possible. The sensation is aroused by stimulation of the visual receptors. Physically and spiritually. I know there are other meanings for light, but in this writing, this is what will be meant when using the word. In the spiritual world, the spiritual illumination, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Light and truth in translating the Bible can sometimes be interchangeable. A lighthouse beacon is used to warn ships they are close to land that could be a danger of running aground. In the same way, the Bible is like that beacon of light to warn us of spiritual dangers in our lives. Now the word darkness. The total or near total absence of light. A lack of knowledge or enlightenment. Physically and spiritually. Darkness and evil in the translation of the Bible can sometimes be interchangeable. When referring to the Dark Ages, it means the lack of knowledge or enlightenment. The next thing that, to me, is the evilest and was introduced into the world by Satan himself to confuse people and make them believe a lie. The word church. We believe it to mean a building, an organization, a denomination, or a name. In my opinion, it doesn't mean any of these things. The church is people. Living stones, as the Bible puts it. The church is made up of living stones, it is not a building. We all say, we are going to church, which is invalid. We should be saying, we are going to a chapel building to gather with the church, the people make up the church, so we cannot go to church, we are the church. One more thing that is not true. We cannot join a church like a Protestant or Catholic church. No one joins a church, God adds to his church as he sees fit. Acts 2 verse 47 tells us, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. No one joins a church, the Lord adds to his church, there is no such thing as plural churches, there is only one true church, God's church. With this out of the way, let us get started. Chapter 1 Light and Darkness I came up with the idea to write this paper after finishing the heroes of the Reformation, the story of their trials and triumphs. The world was in what we called the Dark Ages during their lifetime. I believe we are going through even a darker time as we are coming to the end of this age. We are in such darkness because the truth is wrapped in the darkness of lies. We are talking about spiritual light and dark in this writing. The best way I can explain what I am talking about is to use myself as an example. Like many of the reformers, I came from a Catholic background. My mother raised my sister and me in the faith of that church. Growing up, I accepted what they taught as truth and never even questioned it. When I got older, I drifted from the faith and was at a point in my life where I wasn't sure what I believed. Something happened in my life that made me see a flaw in the Catholic Church. When my mother and father were married, my mother was excommunicated from the Catholic Church because she had married a man that was married twice before. When my father died, my aunts came to the house with a Catholic priest to welcome my mother back into the Catholic Church. My mother died three months after my father. The thought was on my mind, what a bunch of hypocrites. When she was married to my father, and they loved one another, she was not good enough to belong to the church, but after he died, she was? It didn't sit right with me. After that, I lost all faith in the church and God, at that point, my life went downhill. Some years passed with no thought of God or the church, and with my life in turmoil, I was considering suicide, in fact, I attempted it. I will not go into details, but I will say I left my wife and kids and relocated from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to a little town in southeast Minnesota. After being separated for a few months, my wife, kids, and I were reunited as a family. Again, not going into details, I lost my job because the place I worked closed its doors, my car threw a rod, I couldn't pay the rent, I was being evicted, and I ran out of fuel oil, and it was 22 below zero. At that time in my life, God was going to get my attention. One freezing morning with no heat in the house, I got up from the mattress I was sleeping on with my wife and all my kids, in the one room, I had a little space heater to keep us somewhat warm as we slept with our coats on. Being new in the area, I didn't know many people who could help us out of our troubles. I went out into the living room, 
where I could see my breath as I was breathing. Not even believing in God, I don't know why I got on my knees and started to pray a faithless prayer. I said, Lord if you are out there, you are the only one that can help us. I said more, but I can't remember what I said. I got off my knees and went into town, finding some needed help. Again, not going into detail because this is not why I am writing, and I am trying to get back on track. After that prayer, I believe God answered, I started my quest to learn more about a God that could answer a prayer like mine. When I left Milwaukee, I left everything behind. Material things didn't mean much to me with all the problems I had hanging over me. Life is more than stuff. At that time in my life, the only thing I left that I wanted at that moment was a Bible that I got for my mother when I was in the military. It was one of those big Catholic Bibles with all the pretty pictures. Let me tell you how God was working in all this. My daughter had a friend when we lived in Milwaukee that had a brother that lived in Minneapolis that was going back to Milwaukee for a short time and would be returning to Minneapolis. I asked him if he would check to see if that Bible was still in our old house, which he did. I told him where we kept the Bible and to look and see if it was still there. When he returned with the Bible, he said the house was vandalized and there was nothing left in the place but this Bible. It was untouched and right where I said it was. God was protecting his word. Through reading, I came to the light of the truth that salvation is not found in a church, but through God's word, I saw that faith in Christ alone is where it is found, I learned it was the object of one faith that saves. Not faith in a church, but in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. After finding this out, I could see the darkness all around me. Anyone standing in the light of the truth of God's word can see this darkness that is not seen by those still walking in it. I am about to write about this, hoping you will find the same light I found. I knew for a fact that I had found the truth, and if you are asking, how did I know it was true? Then I will tell you how I know. In this writing, I will be attacking false doctrines in teaching, but because others do not believe the way I do, I will not burn them on a stake or torture them or do them any harm as the Catholic Church did during the Dark Ages. Listen to the recordings I have on the internet of the Six Heroes of the Reformation or Red Fox Book of Martyrs or By Their Blood, and you will see how evil the Church was. Chapter 2 When I first came to this beautiful light of spiritual truth, I started to write a book entitled Poison Comes in More Than Bottles. It was all about the false teaching of the Catholic Church, but I found it was full of bitterness and not very Christian-like, it was full of hatred. Yes, I was very bitter toward the church for where it is leading many of my friends and family. After many years of feeling this way, I have realized that I need to make people aware of what the Catholic Church is all about. All one has to do is read or listen to the videos I made on the heroes of the Reformation to see their true history. Still, people must be aware of the evil forces driving this church to lead many down the road to hell with their lies and false teaching. It is full of darkness coming up from the pit of hell itself. So that you know, I love Catholics, it is just the church that has blinded the spiritual eyes of the people and has caused them to believe all the lies they have been propagating. And remember, I, at one time, thought of them as truth. When you ask someone at a bank how they can tell when they get counterfeit money, they will tell you the best way is to compare it with the real thing. All one has to do is compare the teachings and doctrines of the church with that of the Bible, the real thing is to see that it is lying to the people who trust them. I live in a predominantly Catholic town, or maybe I should say, area because of the influence of the church in the region. Many could say this because of this church's widespread hold on the world. Just think about the parables the Lord gave about the mustard seed and the leaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Both parables speak of something evil. The mustard seed should only produce a bush, not a tree, and the birds are pictured in another parable as evil ones. The leaven is sin that will grow out of control like the leaven spreads throw out the dough. We also know that there is good and evil in the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, which is pictured in the parable of the wheat and tares, or as we call them, weeds, the good fish and the bad fish. There is so much we can learn from the parables. 
the Lord sheds light on the definitions by explaining some of the meanings. With this said, I want you to understand that it is not only the Catholic Church that this has happened to, but the dark forces in this universe have infiltrated other churches. My thoughts on those in the church who are teaching might not even know they are teaching falsely. Their spiritual eyes have been blinded by the power that controls the church. This power has a grip on those in high places. The scripture teaches us. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I hope you can see I am not attacking people or individuals but against the powers behind them. There are people in the world today that are possessed by demons. These are the cosmic powers that are spoken of in the passage I just quoted. Through the dark ages, these powers were disguising themselves as angels of light, the church. They could do this because they were surpassing the truth by hiding the word of God from the people. It wasn't until the heroes of the Reformation brought the Word of God to the people that these captives were set free. Today, even though we have the Word of God, the Bible, and we have it at our beck and call, the evil forces have put things in our way to see this fact. We have the pleasures of life before us, things like sex, money, and other sins that are desirable to the flesh. Like the old beer commercial, you only go around life once, so grab all the gusto you can. What I say to that is, you fool, you don't know if today your soul is required of you, then you have to account for your actions. The devil has deceived many people, lying about spiritual things, and he is using churches to do the deceiving. He has people believing doctrines that are not even taught in scripture. They are disguised as traditions. They were lies, to begin with, passed down as if they were true. If it is not in the Bible, don't believe it. Or if it is in the Bible but taken out of context, don't believe that either. The little chapel I attend and fellowship with other Christians have a church next door. The pastor of this church got people from different churches in the area to come and share their beliefs and doctrines. I took them up on the offer so I could share the gospel with others. The last one to come was a Catholic theologian. He came dressed all in black with a large crucifixion around his neck. It looked like it was cumbersome and probably was. To me, it was all show. He shared some scripture and took it out of context. I kept asking him to read a little farther down to get the true meaning, but he wouldn't do it. The pastor of the church we were in said we were not here to debate. I said, but the truth is the truth. My words went unheeded. I will tell you more about this pastor in a moment. The scripture he was sharing was so he could prove his belief that the host and the cup of wine were the body and blood of Christ. Their doctrine on transubstantiation. The scripture he shared was what the Lord said in John 6. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He stopped reading there, and when I asked him to read down a little and he would not, he would have read. It is the Spirit who gives life the flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. You see how taking something out of context can distort the meaning. What this theologian was doing was applying scripture physically, and the Lord meant it spiritually. He was trying to make scripture fit his beliefs instead of having the scripture as his final authority. By doing this, he had to be under the influence of the evil one. Okay, now back to what I wanted to say about the pastor of this church. To get to know him better, I invited him to have coffee with me so we could talk about spiritual things. I had already told him my testimony, how I came to trust Jesus Christ for my salvation, so I asked him to share his testimony and how he decided to become a pastor. Here is the story he told me. I was over in Africa on a mission trip, and while there, we would eat lunch at McDonald's. One day, I took notice of some beggars along the road that had no legs, and some had no arms, and I thought to myself that they couldn't go to McDonald's for lunch, so I quit going. After that, I wanted to help people, so I became a pastor. It went something like that. There was no mention of Christ, salvation, or even God or the Bible in the whole testimony he gave. Here he was a spiritual leader of a somewhat large church, and he didn't even know the Lord Jesus Christ personally. It was a good case of the blind leading the blind. 
I wonder how many churches there are in this exact situation. Chapter 3 In this chapter, I want to look at evil in the world and man's heart. When I use the term man, I mean it as God told it. It says God created man, male, and female, he created them. When using the word man, it is referring to both sexes. When sin entered the world through our first parents, it spread like the leaven we discussed earlier. By the time Noah came on the scene, God had said it had grieved him in his heart that he created humankind. God said this. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Let's look at what the Bible says about the human race. We see that in man's heart is where the evil one attacks. It is the man that allows this to happen. He intends to allow evil thoughts to rule his life. The Picture of the Human Race None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together, they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. What a bleak picture, now we know why there is so much evil in the world. There is this spiritual darkness all around us, if God had not left us the light of his word, we would be in total darkness. Man is by nature evil, along with this, we have the God of this world, the devil himself, to add to all the evil. During the days of Noah, I believe the light was almost out, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, so the light didn't go out entirely. Noah believed God and built the ark to save his family, the ark is a picture of Christ. Now it tells us in the last days it will be like in the days of Noah. What is meant by this? We saw that in those days, the wickedness of man was great in the earth. I believe we are seeing this come about in the days we are living now. The reason is that we have taken God out of everything. Every day we see violence increasing, lawlessness all around us, children being aborted, children being exploited, human trafficking, crooked and lying politicians, and this list go on and on our government, our schools, and out of our society in general. God is no longer part of our lives. The only ones that acknowledge God are Christians. The day is coming when an extraordinary event will take place. We read. And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. I believe the one who restrains is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is within every believer, and when we are removed, the lawlessness will go unrestrained. Then the Lord will return with judgment on an ungodly world. Every Christian should be aware of this. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep, as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep we might live with him. Therefore encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. That day is coming sooner than anyone thinks. I am an old man who could see it come in my day. As you read the above scripture, you see a lot of light and darkness in these verses. You see people of the day and people of the night. Before I was a Christian, I was a night person. I went out at night and slept during the day. Now I am just the opposite. Night people love the darkness so they can hide their sins. I know because I was there and did this. 
When it is said, those who get drunk are drunk at night, it would have been me. I was drunk just about every night. I own a bar, and it was party time all the time. But God stopped my mad career. Chapter 4 Are you following the Lord, or are you following the crowd? Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. This scripture tells us not to follow the crowd, that is the easy way, but it leads to destruction, and many find it this way. But if you want to follow Christ, it will be hard, and the way in is narrow because few are seeking it. While writing this, I know in my heart that not many will want to read it because so many people could care less about spiritual things. The God of this world has blinded their eyes to all these beautiful truths. And the most significant thing they cannot see is that God loves them and doesn't want to see anyone go to hell. He wants all to come to repentance and receive forgiveness for their sins. Remember what happened in Noah's days. There were thousands, maybe millions of people on the earth when God sent a flood to cover the whole world, and they all died except eight souls in the ark. This scripture is a warning. Many and few. Narrow and wide. Something to think about when it comes to judgment. If you are a Christian, you should let your light shine before men so they can see your good works. We are to show the lost world where people walk in darkness as the Lord's light. We are to be a walking Bible, sharing the Word of God, if people will not pick up the Bible and read it, then they should be reading us. If you watched all my videos on the heroes of the Reformation, then you will have gotten a look at the lives of those who entered by the narrow gate, their lives were hard but fully rewarding, and some had the crown of martyrdom waiting for them when they got to heaven. When I look into a crowd, I see three kinds of people. I see true Christians, religious and secular people who have no religion or don't practice the one they profess to follow. Think about what group you belong to because I want to address each separately. First, I have been talking to the Christian and the religious, so I will start with the secular one who has no religion or does not practice the one they have. If you fall in this group, you are better off than those who are religious. Before I came to Christ, I fell into this group. I know I was a sinner, and I knew it and didn't care. I told a priest this. He wanted me to go to confession, and I asked him why. And then told him I knew I was a sinner and didn't care and was going to go out and sin more because I enjoyed my sin, I took pleasure in them. Some of you might feel the same way I did, so there is hope for you. I never gave the afterlife much thought, I was young and foolish and thought I was invincible. I didn't realize that I could have died and gone straight to hell. There were many times I would get drunk, drive my motorcycle like a madman, and be in a few accidents. Looking back at this, I see God was merciful to me, a fool. If you are testing God like I was, be careful, your life might end suddenly, and you will end up in hell and be there for all eternity, which is a long time. Chances are you might not pick up a Bible alone, read it, so remember that you have been warned if you are reading this. God uses mere men to open the eyes of spiritually blind people, and this might be the last time you get a warning. Now let me talk to the religious people that might be reading this, you might be thinking, I am alright, I am not in that group you just talked about, I go to church and try to do what is good, God wouldn't send me to hell, would he? You might be asking why God gave us the Ten Commandments? I have heard the saying, if you stand in a garage, it will not make you a car, just like going to a so-called church does not make you a Christian. Obeying the commandments of God will not save you either. God gave us the law to show us how bad we are because none of us follow the rules of God. Have you ever told a lie, then you are a liar? Have you ever slacked off on the job you have stolen time from your employer, making you a thief? Have you ever looked at someone with lust? The Lord said that is the same as adultery and makes you an adulteress. The law shows us who we are and is meant to turn us to Christ. The only way to get to heaven and stay out of hell is to get there on Christ's righteousness, not ours. We have no righteousness. Our religions will not help us, we need to turn our lives over to a loving Savior who paid the price for our salvation. The last group I will address is the Christian, and remember, I fall into this group, so I am also talking to myself. As Christians, we need to be into the Word daily and to be looking for God's direction in our lives. 
We need to be trying to reach people in the first two groups and give them the good news that God loves them and his heart's desire is not to see any go to hell. God did not create robots but people with free will, so everyone will make their own choice on where they spend eternity, God is not making their choices for them, and they have to be told this fact. People will not pick up the Bible, and Satan has blinded the eyes of those that are perishing. Remember this. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But this scripture doesn't stop here, it goes on to say. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. An excellent way to end this chapter would be to quote what I heard in a lecture by John Nelson Darby on the hopes of the Church of God. Quote, Thus, the hope of the Church is not alone salvation, that is, to escape the wrath of God, but to have the glory of the Son himself. Amen. Chapter 5 in writing this book, my aim is to try and bring you out of the darkness into the marvelous light of God. If you are already in this light, may it cause you to walk in this light and to let your light shine in this dark world? Remember what the Lord said in the Beatitudes. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Another reason I am writing this is to warn people about evil coming into the churches since the beginning of the church age. The Lord said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He meant the true church, not the false churches we have today. The church is not a building or an organization, it is the people, the living stones, that make up the real church. It comprises all the saints of all ages, past and future. The true believer in Christ makes up the church, which is the church that the gates of hell will not prevail against, it is Christ's church. One thing recorded in Matthew 13 is the tares and wheat parable, and here is what Darby had to say about this parable. The tares, namely, the evil which Satan has done where the good grain has been sown, are to increase until the harvest, which is the end of this dispensation or age. The evil which he has caused by heresies, false doctrines, false religions, all this evil will continue, increase, and ripen, these tares, we say, will increase in the Lord's field until the harvest. Here, then, is a positive revelation, which gives a formal contradiction to the idea of the millennium by the Holy Spirit, apart from the return of the Lord. Because things are going to get worse, it tells us that this darkness will increase until the end of the age and the return of the Lord. Does this mean we stop warning people that this is happening? By no means. We need to be warning them even more as that day approaches. If you don't think the end is close, then start to look at what is going on in the world as I write this book. World Economic Forum is going on, and everything discussed leads to a one-world order. The wealthy elite is behind the high prices and the one-world currency they want to introduce. The plan is to indoctrinate us into the one-world government and the one-world currency, and you won't be able to buy or sell unless you go along with this plan. I believe we will see the Antichrist coming on the scene any day now. The world elites are laughing at your problems. The New York Times ran an article that said, Economic chaos is good for the climate. It continued to praise inflation as a way to drive welcome change for the planet and adjust what we eat to save our pocketbooks and the planet. President Biden grants Earth's climate stability through higher gas prices, according to the 2012 New York Times. They claimed a massive increase in gas prices would result in climate stability. 
Another headline, United States summer fuel shortages could be worse than 1970 oil crisis, the editor-in-chief New York Times. One more remark, a Seattle Times columnist wrote, high gas prices? They're just what we need. This is essential to preventing global catastrophe. My reader must have heard of the Great Reset, it is upon us as I write. As I was reading through Darby's lectures on the hopes of the of the Church of God, his fifth lecture was entitled, Progress of Evil on the Earth. Even back in the 1800s, they could see the world getting eviler. Let me take a clip from his lecture to show how it fits in today's world. I will change some of the old English to match today's English. What we are about to consider will tend to show that, instead of permitting ourselves to hope for a continued progress of good, we must expect a progress of evil, and that the hope of the earth being filled with the knowledge of the Lord before the exercise of his judgment, and the consummation of this judgment on the earth, is delusive. We are to expect evil, until it becomes so flagrant that it will be necessary for the Lord to judge it. This statement fits today. We are in a time when good is considered evil, and evil is considered good. Just look at our court system. Justice cannot be found. Years ago, I heard about the Spanish Inquisition but never knew much about it. Today I just finished publishing an audiobook written in 1921 by CJL entitled Macken Carlson's Diary. A story of the Inquisition in Spain and Holland. The book has 24 chapters and I spent the day reading the entire book while publishing it. The text and storyline were taken from Macken Carlson's diary that her father gave her on her 12th birthday and she completed it when she was 46. Written between 1565 and 1599, it was the best history lesson one could read on the Inquisition in Spain and Holland. I recommend everyone listen to the audiobook, I have it online free on YouTube, BitChute, Rumble, YouTube, Anchor, and Spotify. Just search for the title. The reason I mention it here is that it shows the evil in the church. The false church, Satan's church has so much power, and they wanted to keep it to control the people. They did it by keeping the Word of God, the Bible, out of the hands of the people. They kept it in a language the common people didn't understand. If only the people of our day could see how evil the church is, it was back then and is still as evil today. It is not the church of God like they think it is. I have friends and family that are following all the lies they are being told, and the reason is that they blindly believe what they are being taught without comparing it with what the Bible teaches. I felt I had to write this booklet to warn people, and so many people are following the lies being told. My hope and prayers are that your spiritual eyes will be open to know the evil one, the devil himself is the god of this world. And if you don't come to God's word spiritual light, you will stay in spiritual darkness and go off into total darkness for all eternity. Only you can prevent this from happening.